Pasadena, Fresno. All right. Hey, Wayne. Hey, go ahead. All right. Welcome, everyone. Good Medicine Way. All those in attendance here at um, our location here at 2210 Silver Southeast in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Welcome. Glad to see you came. I know there are a lot of followers of our friend Mark Charles here, and great that he can see him in person here and see his books and get a signed book. So really glad that he could make it here and looking at his schedule here he's still got plenty to go here yet he's got Pasadena Fresno and San Francisco to go yet so he's getting making his way around quite a quite a bit here so I'm pastor Casey Church of the Good Medicine Way here in Albuquerque and tonight is an off night from us we uh, we do Monday nights when we have our service and one of the reasons we do Monday nights is because it's, uh, Sundays is a very bad time to reach out to Native American people. They're either at the powwow, they're either going to a powwow, or they're at, on a, attending one, or they're on their way home. So we meet ours on, on Monday nights, and we have a good, good group of people that come. And this seems to be the biggest draw, is our virtual hybrid program that we do. Last night, we had 25 people on that were watching our, our speaker last night, and I think our highest one was a two, two times ago with uh, our friend, my intern, Christina Cantanara. She, uh, she drew 40, 40 people, and she's a young lady who's got a Master's of Divinity and just graduated from a school called Nates, an indigenous learning community that I'm a part of. And we just want to welcome all you in the virtual land as well. So tonight is Tuesday night, and we opened it up because Mark, he told us that he could come on this night, and we wanted to make it a, a good night for him to share with you and to share virtually as well. So I want to open us up with prayer. And then uh, my friend here, uh, Brian, and I, and a couple others are going to sing a song for our opening song to get his coin. The Father, we, we thank you for this this evening that you made possible by giving us a soaking rain just before everything started here, cooling things off in this hot weather. I pray that you just give us a, a good time tonight. Let us be encouraged and, and uplifted by the words. I know there's some pretty critical words that are going to be said tonight, but I, I believe it's really eye-opening for us to know these things, Lord that you would just uh, give us ears to hear and encourage us as we uh, listen to Mark and as he tells us many other stories I hear he's going to say as well, Lord, that you will just give us uh, those ears. Thank you for the leadership here at Good Medicine Way, that they've made possible uh, some good food and good fellowship and a good place to meet. So as we go in tonight, we just give this meeting to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. No. Oh, you can't hear. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna start all over again. Okay. <laughs> so I just prayed and asked the Lord to be with us, sister, in this time. And thank you for everyone coming here, person, person, and also in the virtual land. So uh, I've known Mark for almost 20 years now, when he was living out here on the reservation and doing some ministry here, and then uh, somehow uh, he moved. He moved to Washington, D.C., and uh, kind of lost track for him a bit. But then we heard about him uh, running for president as an independent candidate, and that just uh, sparked my ears. And then I heard that he was writing a book and that he was going to be bringing some really deep truths about the, uh, the Constitution coming out. And reading that book was just uh, really enlightening, uh, called Unsettling Truths. So he, he's got a... Let him introduce himself in his language and also uh, his good friend, Ben around. We've had him on our virtual program before and hope to have him again sometime in the future. So, Mark, would you come and join us here and introduce yourself and then we'll, uh, if we get ready, we'll have an opening song.
Voyate. It's good to be here and see everybody. Mark Charles Yinish, yeah. Tsin Bake Dina Nishle, Doto Huglini Bashis Jean. Tsin Bake Dina Dasha Chedo Toto Chini Dashanella. In our Navajo culture, as many of you know, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Tsin Bake Dina Nishle. Loosely translated, that means I'm from the Wooden Shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsinbeke Dene'e. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also want to acknowledge that here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we are on the lands of the Pueblos, and there are many Pueblos all around this area, and I want to honor each of these Pueblos. We have the Sandia and Laguna and Taos and many of the other Pueblos around here. I want to honor the, the Pueblo nations and the, the Pueblo people um, who have been stewarding these lands for thousands of years. I want to thank you for your commitment to these lands. I want to thank you for your incredible hospitality, and I just want to state how honored I am to be back on these lands today, so close to Dinete, which is the lands of our Navajo people, uh, just a little bit further to the west. And so, ahiahat, all of my Pueblo relatives. I also want to acknowledge um, the Tiwa people um, who are traditional from these lands as well. So I know we have a song that we're gonna start with soon, and then I will give my presentation soon after that. So uh, I think we had lightning nearby, and uh, it messed up the Wi-Fi on the digital mixer. So at this point, I don't have any control over the microphones. So they just at wherever they were set last. I could try to turn it off and reset it, but then I'm afraid we're going to lose everything. So we're just going to roll with what we have. Um, so hopefully that'll all work out. Am I coming out of that speaker right now? Oh wow. So some things are on. All right. So anyway, do we do we, we are one? We are one.
I'm going to hold this microphone so that way I know you can hear me okay. Um, well, thank you for that song. It is very good to be back at Good Medicine Way. I spoke here virtually a few months ago, and uh, I really appreciated the dialogue we had and the conversation I was able to share with you of things I've been wrestling through and thinking about for these past uh, many years. But uh, tonight I want to talk to you about the book that I had a chance to uh, co-author with a very good friend of mine. His name is Sung Chan Ra. And the book is called Unsettling Truth, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. And um, if you go online and you have a chance to look at this, at this book, uh, you will find that there's a lot of people who are talking about it. So the book never really uh, made it into like the national mainstream media, but it is selling fairly well. We've sold about 25 to 30,000 copies of uh, On Selling Truths, which means a lot of people are reading it. There's a lot of seminaries and colleges that are using it as references, and there's a lot of people who are really trying to dig into what we're talking about in this book. And if you read the reviews about Unselling Truths online, one of the phrases you will see frequently is people telling you that this book changed my paradigm. Now, when we talk about paradigms, people often talk about paradigms like there's something personal. There's something that you have for yourself. And there is a way to use paradigm to talk about it's a personal thing. But paradigm is actually a structure or a model that's used by an entire discipline or community. So for example, someone explained this to me just a few weeks ago. They said a few hundred years ago there was a paradigm that said the earth was at the center of the universe. And so all the scientists believed that. Everyone believed the Earth was in the middle of everything. And so they had all these theories and all these ways to explain why the stars were moving certain ways and why things were happening the way they were happening because their paradigm told them that the Earth was at the center. And then the paradigm shifted and they realized the sun was at the center of the solar system. And so they began to then explain things differently because their paradigm shifted. And then they realized there wasn't just one solar system, but there were hundreds, even thousands of them, and all these stars and other spaces out there. And even just, we launched a satellite just a few weeks ago. And so that paradigm is shifting again. And so it's one thing to have a personal paradigm shifted, but it's another thing to have the paradigm shifted. Now, I cannot promise you that if you read On Settling Truth from the introduction all the way through the conclusion, including the 12 chapters in the middle, I can't promise you that your paradigm will be shifted. But I can promise you that if you read the entire book, your paradigm will most likely be challenged. And you will be challenged to think about things in a new way and something you haven't thought about it before. And there's probably a few points in that process of reading this book that you're going to want to throw the book down and curse my name. Or even throw the book against the wall and, and, and write a letter or something. Because there's going to be some things in the book that are going to challenge you in the things that you've always been taught or you've always believed. And what I wanted to talk about tonight is I wanted to talk about some of the paradigms, just a few key points where I think your paradigm will be challenged as you read through this book. So I want to spend about 30 minutes talking about two or three themes from the book that will be challenging as you read through them. And then I want to go beyond that in our last 15 to 20 minutes, and I want to go beyond that, and I want to talk about if you read this entire book and you have your paradigm challenged or maybe even shifted, this is going to cause you to see things differently. And the two things I want to talk about at the end of this talk that is going to, you're going to be see differently because of reading this book, 
are two things that are happening very prevalently in our country today. The first is the discussion on white Christian nationalism. And the second is the whole theme of our nation breaking treaties without consequences. Why does the United States of America feel it has the right to break treaties, not only with native nations, but with nations all around the world? And so we're going to talk about those two things at the end. But before I can get into any of this, we need to talk about the doctrine of discovery. Now, not everybody is familiar with the doctrine of discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery is essentially it's a series of papal bulls, statements or edicts of the Catholic Church. It says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. The Doctrine of Discovery is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, Whatever lands you find that are not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. This is the doctrine that allowed European nations to go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the people because they did not believe Africans were human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was literally lost at sea, land in this new world which was already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. Right? The first paradigm that this book is going to shift for you is the paradigm that says the United States of America was discovered by Europeans. Right? The first chapter of the, the first sentence of the first chapter of Unselling Truths says you cannot discover lands that are already inhabited. Now maybe that sounds like, well, no duh, Mr. Charles, that's very obvious. Well, it does seem very obvious, right? You cannot discover lands already inhabited. Usually when I speak in white audiences, I tell the people, if you don't believe me, leave your car keys and your cell phones and your laptops out, and myself and my native friends will come by and discover them for you. Right? Clearly, that's not discovery. It's stealing, it's conquering, it's colonizing, it's not discovery. If you want to discover lands that are not already inhabited, you have to find a way to dehumanize the people who are already living there. And this is the challenge that we're facing as a nation. So in the past decade, our nation has struggled with this paradigm of discovery. And we've struggled and began to get challenged by maybe we should not celebrate Christopher Columbus, right? Maybe we should celebrate something else. And so there's a lot of places like Albuquerque and other cities and states around the country that are giving up their celebrations of Columbus Day and they are embracing a celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day. And this is because indigenous nations, indigenous peoples from all around the country have challenged our nation and say, hey, let's stop celebrating something that doesn't make any sense and let's instead put the focus on the people who were here first. Now, this is a good thing. This is not a bad thing at all. There's been a lot of movement, there's been a lot of energy to change that celebration. And while I'm grateful that we are beginning to challenge the paradigm on a national level, so much that even in the last year, President Biden declared um, an official national holiday of Indigenous Peoples Day. I'm very grateful for that. The challenge is, is that doesn't actually change much in our day-to-day -day life, right? Yes, it's nice that we stopped celebrating Columbus and now we honor indigenous peoples. That's a very good thing. But that doesn't change the underlying structures of our nation and the values that our country holds. 
See, to challenge that paradigm, we have to go a lot deeper. A few years ago, in 2018, I gave a TEDx talk. The talk was titled, We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History. And in this talk, 18 minutes, 19 minutes in length, I introduced the doctrine of discovery. And I talked about how this doctrine became embedded into the foundations of our nation and how it shaped the values of our country. You see, as I said earlier, if you want to discover lands already inhabited, you first need to dehumanize the people who already live here. So in 1763, King George drew a line down the Appalachian Mountains and he said to the colonies that were living here that they no longer had the right of discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upset the colonies. There were 13 colonies in, in what's now called the United States. There were several colonies up north in what's now Canada. And the 13 colonies in, the United, in what's now the United States were very upset about this proclamation. And so a few years later, they wrote a letter of protest. In their letter, they accused the king, King George, of raising the conditions of how you appropriate land. And then they stated that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages. They signed their letter on July 4th, 1776. Literally 30 lines below the statement, all men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence refers to Native Americans as merciless Indian savages. Making it very clear the only reason the Founding Fathers used that inclusive term of all men is because they had a very narrow definition of who was actually human. So, this actually goes in to the founding documents of our country. I also, in the book, we talk at length about the Constitution. I'm not going to go into length about that here, but the Constitution assumes the same understandings. It starts with the words, we the people. And in Article 1, Section 2, the section of the Constitution that determines who the Constitution covers, it never mentions women. It specifically excludes natives, and it counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. When the Constitution was written, if you take away women, you take away natives, and you take away African people, you know who that left? White men. And technically, it was white landowning men who were the only ones who could vote. So we don't acknowledge that frequently enough that the Constitution was written not to protect natives, not to protect women, not to protect African Americans, but to protect white men. That's why it was written. Everyone else was excluded. We have to wrestle with the implications of that. But in 1823, something else happened because there was a Supreme Court case. It was two white men, European descent, they both said that they acquired the same land. Now, they actually didn't even acquire the same land. They had separate lots of land, but they went to court anyway because they wanted to press the issue. One of them got the land from a native tribe. The other one claimed he bought the same piece of land from the U.S. government, and they were fighting over who owned it. Who had the right to sell the land, the tribe or the government? The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. This was the John Marshall Court. John Marshall is presumed by many to be one of the greatest Supreme Court justices in our nation's history. And his court had to decide who had the right to sell the land, who was the true owner of the land, the native tribe or the government. So they ruled this was in 1823, that discovery is what gave title to the land. This gave title to the government by whose subjects and by whose authority was it made against all other governments, and that title was consummated by possession. 
Later in that opinion, John Marshall, who wrote the opinion, he said this. He wrote this into the opinion. It says, but the tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. To leave them in possession of their land was to leave the land a wilderness. So his argument was that natives are savages, and if we allow them to keep control of the land, the land will never become civilized. This was what they were arguing. So first they said discovery is what gives title to the land, and then they say, but the people who were here first couldn't discover it because they weren't human, they were savages. And so therefore, the right of discovery fell to the Europeans who the court viewed as fully human. In 1823, this created the legal precedent for land titles. Now, the doctrine of discovery gets referenced by the Supreme Court three times by name. Once in 1954, once in 1985, and once in 2005. My TEDx talk went into depth about the 2005 Supreme Court case. I'm not going to go into at great lengths about that. It's all written into the book. But the important thing about that is in the first footnote of the case, where they're laying out precedent and they're talking about how land titles have always been understood, they reference by name in 2005 the doctrine of discovery. Later in that court case, this is what the Supreme Court wrote. Moreover, the properties here involved have greatly increased in value since the Indian nation, the Oneidas, sold them 200 years ago. So the case was the Oneidas were removed from their land in central state New York. New York illegally purchased the lands against the treaties, and they moved the Oneidas out. And in 1990s, the Oneidas came back, and they bought some of their traditional lands on the open market. They paid full price for them, just like if you were to buy land somewhere else as an American citizen. They bought their own land, and they wanted to reestablish their sovereignty over them. The lands they bought were within the city limits of a city called Sherrill, and because they were claiming sovereignty over the lands, they weren't paying taxes on them, and the city of Sherrill wanted their tax revenue, so they sued the Oneida Indian Nation in federal district court. The court ruled in favor of the Oneida people, so the city of Sherrill appealed to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals upheld the lower court's decision, so they appealed a second time to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court heard the opinion in 2005. Again, the first footnote of the case, they referenced by name the doctrine of discovery, and then they said, moreover, the properties here involved have greatly increased in value since the Oneidas sold them 200 years ago. It was not until lately that the Oneidas sought to regain ancient sovereignty over lands converted from wilderness to become parts of city like Cheryl. They're making the exact same argument that the court made in 1823. They're just not using the word savages. But they're saying you gave up the land. Since white people have moved in, the land become very valuable. It's no longer a wilderness, we've civilized it, and now you cannot have sovereignty over it again. This was their argument. Now the shocking thing about this Supreme Court case is they conclude that we reject the unification theory of the United Indian Nation and the lower courts, so they reverse the lower courts rulings, and we hold that the standards of federal Indian law, again, footnote one, doctrine of discovery, and federal equity practice preclude the tribe from rekindling embers of sovereignty that long ago grew cold. They're even getting poetic as they take our land from us, right? Now, the shocking thing about this opinion is this was in 2005. 
And the author of this opinion was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was a liberal justice voicing dissent against conservatives on an increasingly conservative Supreme Court, and she was seen by many as fighting on the side of the marginalized. And she actually was. The problem is, is because land titles are based on the legal understanding that natives aren't human but were savages, this means white supremacy is a value held by both parties. Now see, this is where we run into problems. When I ran for president, people told me, if you try to change Social Security, you're going to lose all support and no one's going to want to talk to you. Well, that might be true, but you know what people want to talk about even less than changing Social Security? Land titles. Nobody wants to talk about land titles. If Social Security is the third rail of politics, land titles is the nuclear generator behind the third rail that no one wants to even think is there. They don't even want to consider it. The way, this is where I lose so many of my audiences because we don't know what to do with this. Even a lot of people who do social justice work and are activists, once we get to the point of land titles, people tend to throw up their hands and they don't know what to do. One time, this was about maybe five years ago, I was speaking at a conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was in a very impoverished neighborhood. It was mostly people of color, African Americans living in that neighborhood. And the church there invited me to come and speak at their conference that they were holding for people from around the country about social justice and I was asked to speak about the doctrine of discovery. I was the last speaker of the conference and the afternoon before I spoke, the church took us on a tour of their neighborhood. Now in their neighborhood there was a school building that had burned down and because the school had burned down, they were busing their students all over the city and they asked us to pray that the school could be rebuilt so they could educate those kids in their own neighborhood. They also took us to a community center where they were raising up leaders from that local area to be leaders for that community. And they asked us to pray that they could develop strong leaders for this community. Finally, they took us to a house that had been abandoned. About half of the houses in that neighborhood were abandoned, and all of the other houses were rentals. There were no owner-occupied housing in that neighborhood. The houses were either empty or they were all rental units. And they asked us to pray that more of the people who were renting could buy their homes so that they could lift up the neighborhood. If you want to do community development, one of the best ways to do it without gentrifying, which means moving all the poor people out, is you help the people who are renting to purchase their houses so they own the houses they live in, and that's going to help them to take better care of the neighborhood. We then, so they prayed for that, then we went back to the church, and I gave my lecture on the doctrine of discovery, and I laid out everything I just told you about land titles. Now, at the end of the conference, they said, we want you to leave the people of the conference with something really difficult to think about. And so I said to the people, I said, this afternoon, you took me around your neighborhood and you showed me many of the challenges that you face and you prayed that God would help more people who are renting their homes to be able to buy them. I've now demonstrated to you through my lecture that land titles are based on the legal understanding that natives aren't human. I'm wondering how this makes you feel because you want to buy homes. 
And now I'm telling you that the title to your house is based on the understanding that natives aren't human. So I'm wondering how this makes you feel. And the people said, well, you know, we have a hard time getting loans. We don't have good jobs in our neighborhood. I said, no, that's not the question. You prayed. You asked God for your help, for help. I'm not asking you to solve the problem. I'm just asking you, how does it make you feel knowing that what you are aspiring to, which is buying a house, is dependent upon natives being classified as subhuman? And the people just looked at me. And I said, this is the problem. We don't know what justice looks like when everything our country has is stolen. Right? This is where people don't know what to do. It's such an overwhelming foundational level problem. So while it's great that we're stopping or at least we're con reconsidering celebrating Columbus Day and instead we're celebrating Indigenous People Day, that's a good thing. I don't mind that at all, but that does nothing about land titles. Land titles is why the court as recently as 2005 essentially said natives are still savages and they cannot have sovereignty over their own lands. If we want to live in a nation where everybody is equal, we must do something about land titles. And this is one of the paradigms that this book is going to challenge you to think about and make you feel very uncomfortable. Another paradigm that I'm going to try and shift for you in this book is the paradigm that says the United States of America, primarily white people, have a land covenant with the God of Abraham. And Turtle Island is their promised land. Now maybe you're hearing me say that and you're like, that's ridiculous. Nobody believes that. Nobody thinks that way. I don't think that way. Well, the best way to find out how people think or feel and what they believe is to look at them in times of crisis right? When things are going really bad. So I want you to think back to the last time your church or your community was wrestling, was really afraid because there was a national crisis. Maybe it was during 9-11. Maybe it was during one of the, of, the, of the violent shootings we have around our country. Maybe it was during a hurricane or some other kind of thing. Maybe it's because you think the morality of our nation is falling down the drain. Maybe there's what, think back to a time when not just you, but your entire church was really afraid afraid of what was happening. Now I can almost bet you that when your church came together during that time of crisis and you cried out to God for help because you were literally feeling afraid, I'm willing to bet that at some point in that period, your church or your elders or your pastor or at least some people in the back of the room prayed this prayer from 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. The prayer says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will what? Heal their land. That's a promise God gave to the people of Israel at the dedication of the temple when he was stating, talking about the land covenant that the people of Israel had with the God of Abraham. The United States of America does not have a land covenant with the God of Abraham. Should we confess our sins? Absolutely. Should we turn from wicked ways? Absolutely. 
Will God hear our prayers and forgive our sins? Absolutely. Will God heal our land? There's nothing in the scriptures that says he'll do that. Why? Because he didn't give Europeans this land. This land was ethnically cleansed. This land was stolen. This land was taken through a doctrine of discovery. If you're an auntie or an uncle or a grandmother or a grandfather or a parent, and your child or your grandchild or your, someone in your family steals a bicycle, right? And they're riding the bike and they're so happy they didn't get caught and they're riding the bike and they crash the bike into a fence and the bike falls apart and the wheel gets lost and the paint's all scratched and the t seat falls off and they come to you and they're crying and they say, Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, I, 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 I crashed my bike and, and now it's broken. Right? You pick them up. You probably tend to whatever wounds they had. You fix up the bike, but do you let them keep it? No, they stole it, right? There's nothing in the scriptures that says if the United States of America confesses its sin, turns from its wicked ways, and, and receives forgiveness, that God's going to heal its land because God did not give this land to Europeans. The American church does not have a land covenant with the God of Abraham, but this is a part of most Americans' theology because this is what we cry out to when we're afraid. It's so bad that in 2015, when Benjamin Netanyahu was speaking to a session of Congress about a treaty that the Obama administration was negotiating about nuclear weapons and the Congress was very divided. Congress was not even talking to each other and he had to get everyone on both sides of the aisle behind him and so early in his speech he said to our Congress, this is the, primer, the Prime Minister of Israel said to our Congress because the United States and Israel we share a common destiny the destiny of promised lands. And he received applause from both sides of the aisle. If you're under, ever wondering why the United States of America has bipartisan support for Israel, it's not because both nations love freedom and justice and equality. We actually need Israel's Old Testament understanding of promised lands to justify what our nation did to Native Americans and African Americans. And Israel, the modern nation state of Israel, needs the United States flourishing or prospering as a nation with a manifest destiny to justify what they're doing to Bedouins and Palestinians. The reason the United States of America and the modern nation of Israel have such a close relationship has nothing to do with freedom or equality. It's because we need each other to justify our oppression. It's a very dysfunctional, codependent relationship. And it's incredibly unhealthy. Now, one of the more challenging paradigms so that's a paradigm that's going to be challenged for you as you read this book. Now, another paradigm that's going to be challenged for you, this isn't as much of a, of a, a change. It's acknowledging the destructiveness of something that we understand already. There's a statement that says, the victors write the history, right? If you win a war, you get to write the history of that war. This is just kind of commonly accepted. The victors write the history. Two of the hardest chapters in this book to write, for me, were chapters 9 and 10. Because in chapters 9 and 10, we wrestle with this paradigm that says the victors write the history 
and this is a good thing. Early in this chapter, we introduce you to two people. They're about the same age. They both now died, but they were born about the same time in the early 1900s. One was from Germany. His name was Oscar Groening. The other was from the US. His name was Robert McNamara. Oscar Groening, who was born in Germany, served in the German military, and he was actually placed at one of the concentration camps, the death camps that they were using to kill the Jewish people. He wasn't a soldier. He wasn't gassing people. He wasn't shooting people. He wasn't even guarding people. Oscar Groening was an accountant. And they were stealing stuff as they brought the Jewish people into the camp. They would take all their possessions and they would give them to Oscar and Oscar would count them, assess their value, and then send up a, a report to the, to the German government about what the value was they had taken from the Jewish people. As he was working there, he saw what was happening in the camp. He did not like it. He was not comfortable with it. And he requested a transfer numerous times. His transfer was denied frequently until near the end of the war, he was finally transferred into the infantry and he was actually on the front lines and was captured and was in a prison camp at the end of the war when it ended. And after the war ended, he was released from the prison camp and went back to Germany and lived there quietly for most of his life. In the 1990s, the Holocaust denier movement began to get traction. People who said the Holocaust didn't happen. And this really pained Oscar Groening because he knew what his country did. He knew what had happened there. He saw it with his own eyes. And so he began to speak out about it. And he would tell people that, no, this is what we did. And this is the atrocities we committed. And he would give interviews to help silence the people who were denying the Holocaust had happened. He gave one very public interview with a more national um, news agency called the BBC. And after that interview, he was arrested. And he was charged with the murder of 300,000 Jewish people. Because that's how many people were killed at the camp he was serving in. And when he went before the judge, he said, I have no doubt that I am complicit because I was a part of the military that did these horrible things. He said, but you have to decide if I'm legally guilty. He went to trial and he was found guilty of the murder of 300,000 people. And he was appealing that when he died. He was like 90 years old and he died. And he died a condemned war criminal. Now, there was another man, now about the same age, born almost the same time, just a few years apart. His name was Robert McNamara. Robert McNamara grew up in California. He served in the US military during World War II. And he was also someone who worked with data. He was an analyst with the Air Force. And he would analyze the bombings that the Air Force was doing over the Pacific Theater, over Japan. And as he was analyzing the bombs we were dropping, and he noticed that we were not hitting our target very often because we were flying our planes very high. And so he recommended to the general he was serving under that they fly the planes lower so they would hit their targets better. The general he was working for was named General LeMay, and he was actually planning a very strategic bombing raid over Japan. This wasn't Nagasaki. This wasn't Hiroshima. This was called Operation Meeting House, which was the firebombing of Tokyo. Nagasaki and Hiroshima killed 40,000 and 60,000 people, respectively. Operation Meeting House, which wasn't nuclear, killed 100,000 people in a single night. It was the deadliest bombing in the history of the world. And one of the reasons it was so effective is because General LeMay followed Robert McNamara's suggestion and flew the planes lower. 
It was so successful, they've been doing this with all of their bombing raids, including Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And at the end of the war, we had killed nearly 300,000 Japanese civilians in these types of bombing raids. After the war was over, Robert McNamara was given the Legion of Merit, which is a very distinguished military award. And he was working for the Ford Motor Plant up in Michigan when President Kennedy asked him to serve as the Secretary of Defense. He served as the Secretary of Defense during, World, during the Vietnam War. He was one of the architects of the Vietnam War, including the use of Agent Orange. After he served as Secretary of Defense, he was given the Medal of Freedom, which is the highest medal you can get in the U.S. as a civilian. And when he died, he was buried at Arlington National Cemetery with honors. Now, towards the end of his life, Robert McNamara made a documentary. The documentary was called The Fog of War. And in his documentary, he was reflecting on what he had done throughout his life. And this is what he said. He said, the human race prior to World War II and today has not really grappled with the rules of war. Was there a rule that said you shouldn't burn to death 100,000 civilians in a single night? General LeMay said, if we, the United States, lost the war, we would all have been prosecuted as war criminals. And I think he's right. He, and I say I, were behaving as war criminals. So what's the difference between Robert McNamara and Oscar Groening? Neither one of them were soldiers. They both were data analysts. They both were complicit in the death of 300,000 people. One of them died a war hero, and the other died a war criminal. What's the difference between the two? Is it one was good and one was bad? One was moral, one was immoral, one was right and one was wrong? What's the difference? It's who won the war, right? It's who won the war. Oscar Groening's side lost the war, and so he died a condemned war criminal. Robert McNamara's side won the war, and so he died a celebrated and decorated war hero. One of the challenges we have in the United States is the United States has never lost a war that matters. We've never been disarmed. We've never given up large tracts of land. We've never, we've never had a regime change. We've never been successfully invaded. We've never lost a war that matters. So guess what? For 250 years, who's written our own history? Ourselves. Right? Technically, white people have written their own history for 250 years. And this is not a good thing. This is incredibly dangerous. Imagine for a moment if Nazi Germany won World War II. Just imagine. How would their historians have recorded the life of Adolf Hitler? What would they have said about him? Well, he'd be their greatest leader ever, right? He brought them from obscurity to global prominence. How would their historians have recorded the Holocaust? Well, we have people denying the Holocaust today and they lost the war. Imagine if they won the war. What Holocaust? There is no Holocaust. The reason chapters 9 and 10 are going to be so hard for you to read is because we take that understanding and then we apply it to the most celebrated and popular and lifted up president in American history, which is Abraham Lincoln. All, nearly all Americans believe Abraham Lincoln was our greatest president. Most every American looks at Abraham Lincoln as a hero. 
And this chapter is going to, these two chapters are going to demonstrate to you that because the United States has won all of its wars and therefore has written its own history, we did the exact same thing to Abraham Lincoln that we just talked about what would have happened to Adolf Hitler. Chapters 9 and 10 will demonstrate to you that Abraham Lincoln was a blatant and unapologetic white supremacist until the day he died. Chapters 9 and 10 will also demonstrate to you through his orders, through his policies, through his campaigns, that Abraham Lincoln was one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed two bills, one in the spring and one in the summer. He signed the, the Homestead Act, which allocated 160 acres to anyone willing to go west and homestead for 150 years. And he signed the Pacific Railway Act, which allocated land and resources to complete the Transcontinental Railway. Two and a half years after signing those two acts, Abraham Lincoln gave a speech. It was his State of the Union speech in 1864. And this is what he said. 1.5 million acres have been entered in under the Homestead Law and the great enterprise of connecting the Atlantic with the Pacific States by railway and telegraph lines has been entered upon with a vigor that gives assurance of success. I want to share my screen with you a minute because I want you to see what I'm going to talk about here because it's so important for us to understand. Let me share this up here. Why is this not? Hold on, let me try one more time. There we go. Can you see that? You see, this is a map of the United States and the lines of the Transcontinental Railway. In 1862, the Transcontinental Railway was going primarily along the central route and it had reached here to Omaha, Nebraska. Now there were three primary routes. There was this central route that went through Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, um, Nevada, and came out near San Francisco, California. There was a northern route that went through Duluth, started Duluth, Minnesota, went through North Dakota, um, Montana, Idaho, and came out near Seattle, Washington. And there was a southern route that went through the territory of New Mexico, Arizona, and came out near Los Angeles, California. This is the railroad really that goes right through Albuquerque here. Okay? Within two and a half years, of signing those bills in 1862, after the removal of the Dakota and the Winnebago, after the Dakota War and the hanging of the Dakota 38 in 1862, after the removal of the Cheyenne and Arapaho with the Sand Creek Massacre from Eastern Colorado, after the long walk of the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache from the Four Corners area, 1863 to 1865, and after the Bear River Massacre, which was the worst massacre in U.S. history of Native peoples, of the Shoshone in northern Utah and southern Idaho. Abraham Lincoln had literally ethnically cleansed the primary route of the Transcontinental Railway. All of my life, I've blamed the long walk which was the removal of our Navajo people from the Southwest. I've blamed that on Kit Carson, right? He's the captain that went through and burned our Hogans and killed our cattle and our sheep and rounded up our people and marched us down to Bosque Redondo. I 
I went through about a, a six month period where I was researching Abraham Lincoln. And I was reading his policies, I was looking up his orders, I was looking at what he was doing, and it was blowing my mind. I was reading his white supremacist statements in his speeches. It was boggling my mind. And I was asked, this was like in 2019 maybe, no, 2018, I was asked to give a speech at an event in, in uh, Washington, D.C. on President's Day, which was Lincoln's celebrating Abraham Lincoln and around his birthday. And I was given two minutes. And I said, okay, if I have two minutes, I'm going to talk about the horrible things Lincoln had done. And I was only thinking of his white supremacy statements at that time. I didn't even know about the genocide. And that morning, I was sitting in the basement of my house, and I was thinking about what I was going to say that night. I wasn't studying anything. I wasn't reading anything. I was merely just thinking about what I was going to say. And for the first time in my life, I realized that the long walk occurred during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. And it was his policies I later went online and looked at the Library of Congress. I found an order that he signed in 1864 ordering the creation of Boscredondo. His name was on it. And I sat there and I'm just like, oh my gosh. Abraham Lincoln is responsible for the genocide of our Navajo people. It blew my mind. All my life I've been mad at an army captain and not thinking about his commander-in-chief. It boggled my mind. So not only are these two chapters incredibly difficult to read, they were incredibly difficult to write because I had to give up all of these old understandings I had of Abraham Lincoln. And I had to think about his history and his legacy in an entirely new way. And I don't even quote historians. My co-author and I, we don't quote historians in this. We quote Lincoln. His own words will demonstrate to you he was a blatant and unapologetic white supremacist until the day he died. And he, when you stack him up historically, I would even say he was worse than Andrew Jackson. And why do we celebrate him? Because we won our wars. And when you win your wars, you turn war criminals into war heroes. And Abraham Lincoln is absolutely a war criminal. This is why his memorial in Washington, D.C. is literally a temple. This nation's made a god out of him. Another paradigm, and I'm not going to go much into depth on this right now, that this book will shift for you, is the paradigm of trauma. When you deal with this type of history, obviously you start to deal with trauma. Most people are familiar with trauma through the term of PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder. It's an individual diagnosis for someone who experiences a single horrifying event. You get assaulted, you're in a battle, and you get PTSD. You're in a car accident, you get PTSD. There's another trauma called a complex PTSD that doesn't come from a single event. It comes from a series of events. So if, you're, if you get PTSD from being, in a, being assaulted, you get complex PTSD from living in an abusive relationship. If you get PTSD from being in a battle, you get complex PTSD from living in a war zone. Psychologists have observed that 
the symptoms of PTSD, a complex PTSD, are passed down to the children and grandchildren of those who experience it. They don't know how it works, but they've observed it. Then there's another trauma called HTR, which is called historical trauma, which was first observed in native communities after boarding schools and removal. Historical trauma is not an individual diagnosis, it's how psychologists understand the dissatisfaction in a broad community that experienced a complex PTSD together. You can see it not only in native communities, you can see it in African American communities and in Japanese communities after internment camps, after Jewish communities, after the Holocaust. I call historical trauma a multi-generational communal manifestation of a complex PTSD. And we see this evident in our, in our communities, right? We see this around where we live. We know this is real. And so when I go out to speak about these things, I have to prepare for that because my audiences are oftentimes going to be triggered by the stuff I talk about. And so I need to prepare myself so that I can address it more thoughtfully. The problem and the paradigm we want to shift here is while all of that is true, there's another trauma we've never thought about before. Because if you're trying to engage a dialogue on race, what's the most likely group that's going to disrupt or, or disrupt your dialogue? It's mostly not going to be people of color, it's mostly going to be white people. I began observing this as I talked more and more around the country to audiences and oftentimes it was white people who would stand up in the middle of my lectures and call me a liar. And I, ha I was trying to understand what was going on, why, why was I getting this reaction from white people as I was giving these lectures. And I said to some of my colleagues, I think I see trauma in white people. But I don't know how to categorize it because trauma usually afflicts the victim. And they're not victims. And then I found this book. It's by a woman who's become a friend of mine now. Her is a really brilliant psychologist. Her name is Rachel McNair. And she wrote a book called Perpetration Induced Traumatic Stress. Pits. She identifies pits as being just like PTSD, but if PTSD afflicts the victim of the horrifying event, pits afflicts the perpetrator, the person who caused it. She calls it the psychology of killing. If society gives you the right to kill, gives you the right to take a life, her study was, what does that do to you psychologically? And she found it, it find, found it causes a trauma just like PTSD, but it doesn't afflict the victim, it afflicts the perpetrator. And so in chapter 11, I hypothesize that if PTSD has a multi-generational communal manifestation at a complex level that we call historical trauma that afflicts people of color, might not or would not pits also have a multi-generational communal manifestation at a complex level that afflicts white people. And so I began treating white people as another group of traumatized people. Now this is different than how we're used to treating white people in dialogues around race because most often white people are put in one of two categories, either they're racist or they're fragile. And this book, this chapter argues instead of seeing white people first and foremost as racist, which leaves them no space to join the dialogue, or if we see them first and foremost as fragile, which means we have to soothe everything over, what if we instead treat them as traumatized, not victims of trauma, but perpetration-induced traumatic stress, but still experiencing the symptoms of trauma? And chapter 11 will work to change your paradigm on trauma and how it afflicts white Americans. Creating a space for, I think, what is going to be a much healthier dialogue. 
Now that we've talked about those few paradigms, I want to take a few minutes to talk about some things we're going to see differently. Okay, so if you read on Selling Truths and you allow all these paradigms to be challenged and shifted, how are you going to see things differently? And I want to talk about, and I'm going to actually share my screen again. I want to talk about our value, the, the dialogue that's happening currently around the nation, around white Christian nationalism. We're having this conversation right now, right? We're, we're having this whole discussion about um, the, the white nationalist terrorist attack that was put on our capital on January 6th. We're having um, public hearings being broadcast live on television. Our nation is having a dialogue about white Christian nationalism. And the challenge with this dialogue is our nation actually has a very immature and incredibly simplistic political system. Right? We have a two-party system, left and right, Democrat, Republican conservative and liberal. And because it's so immature and so simplistic, what it does is it creates every debate as a binary, as right or wrong. And then the solution it presents is not a complex solution, but a very simplistic solution, which says, let's just get rid of the other side. Just vote them out and just let us do our way and then everything will be fine. And so this is why, our, as our politics have gotten more and more partisan over the past few decades even, we see just everyone saying, well, we just need to vote the other side out and put our party back in and then everything will be fine and we'll be a great nation again. This is the debate we have. Now because we also have this not only simplistic two-party system, but we have a media that plays into it, and most Americans live in a news bubble. And there's two primary news bubbles. There's the Fox news bubble, and there's the CNN and MSNBC news bubble. Most of these, both of these bubbles are incredibly destructive. And if you live in one of these two news bubbles, you are often feeling very angry, you're feeling very scared, and you're blaming everything on the other party. This is what these two news bubbles do. And this is where most Americans live, right? Donald Trump lived in the Fox news bubble, and Joe Biden lives in the CNN news bubble. And most Americans find themselves in one of those two bubbles. And so right now, because of this political system and this media bubble, right now, Republicans are getting the most of the blame for white Christian nationalism. I'm not saying they don't deserve it, but they're getting the bulk of the blame for white Christian nationalism. Right? Most of us have this image. Seared in our brains, correct? This was Donald Trump back in 2020. There was a park right in front of the White House called Lafayette Park. There were protesters there who were protesting violence by police against people of color. On the morning of June 1st, law enforcement was sent into that park and they aggressively cleared it. Donald Trump then walked through the park, went in front of St. John's Church, held up his Bible upside down at first, then he turned it around, didn't even say much, and then walked back. This was absolutely, absolutely, this was a dog whistle to white Christian nationalists. And he was called out for it, and rightfully so. The problem is, this isn't just a right or left problem. On August 26 of 2021, there was a terrorist attack in Afghanistan. And in this attack, which was on an airport in Afghanistan, several US military members lost their lives. 
Now, when he was running for president, Joe Biden said that he, he disliked the, 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 the aggressive words of Donald Trump, who talked about blowing people up and was not afraid to threaten people publicly and globally. And he said if he got into office, he would have a much more respectful demeanor and he wouldn't talk the same way and he would bring respectability back into the White House. And on the day of that terrorist attack, this is what he said. To those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. Right? He's threatening nuclear war. He's threatening just as aggressively as Donald Trump was because this is how Americans want their leaders to respond when they feel threatened. This is why both the left and the right talk this way. He went on to thank the military leaders for helping bring order out of this chaos. And then he said, those who have served through the ages have drawn inspiration from the book of Isaiah when the Lord says, whom shall I send and who shall go for us? And the American military has been answering for a long time, here am I, Lord, send me. Here I am, send me. So just to be clear, Joe Biden the leader of the Democratic Party and the leader of our nation believes that the United States military is answering a prophetic call of the Lord on par with that of Isaiah the prophet. White Christian nationalism is a bipartisan value. Both the left and the right are absolutely guilty of it. Because this is what Americans want to believe. And so if you read this book, you're going to start noticing things like this. Now the last thing I want to talk about is our nation's legacy of broken treaties. And this affects most, about half the people in this room. Right, I don't have to tell you about our nation's legacy of broken treaties. The United States of America has written, I think, over 400 treaties with Native nations. Every single one of them have been broken. Why? Why does this country feel that it has the right to break treaties with Native nations? Well, to understand this, we have to actually go look at some modern day examples and then go into our, our history a little bit. So I want to look at two agreements, first of all. The first agreement is called UNDRIP. People heard of this before, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This was a declaration made in 2007 by the UN. It said that native peoples, indigenous peoples, have the right to self-determination. They have the right to culture and language. They have a right to education and health. They have a right to housing, land, resources, and environment. And they have a right to their own indigenous laws. Now, when this, uh, this statement was given in 2010, every single nation signed on to this except for three or four. Guess which four didn't sign on to it? Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. Why? Why, what do these four nations have in common why they wouldn't sign this Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? Well, historically, Europe has colonized most of the world. But in the past, hundred years or so, it's begun to contract a little bit, right? The British colonized India and they pulled back. They colonized other nations and they pulled back. We colonized the Philippines and we pulled back. But there are four nations where the colonizers didn't pull back, but they stayed. And they now live in authority and somewhat alongside indigenous nations. And this is true in Australia, 
New Zealand, Canada, and the United States, right? And so these four countries are terrified of the thought of stating that indigenous peoples actually have rights. Because the colonizers are still living there, and if they acknowledge the rights of these people, that's going to put their own safety or their own prosperity in a threat. So they didn't sign. Now, this was during the George Bush administration. So maybe you say, well, that was expected. But then the next administration, the Obama administration, our first African-American president, he came into office and we thought, OK, things are going to be different. And they were to some extent. He actually said he was going to join the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And in 2011, he actually did that. To great fanfare, they made a statement that the United States was now going to adhere to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But if you read the statement given by the State Department when they did that, they were actually very specific about what they were agreeing to and what they believed was there. First of all, they said they did not see UNDRIP as legally binding or as a statement of current international law, meaning you can't hold us accountable to it. Second, they said this statement expresses the aspirations of the United States within the structure of the US Constitution. Now, what does Article 1, Section 2 exclude from the Constitution? Native peoples, <laughs> right? Now I want to talk about this next agreement, the JCPOA. This was the agreement that the Obama administration negotiated with Iran about nuclear energy in 2015 and again in 2018. When we signed this agreement in 2015, they were very clear this is not a treaty. It wasn't ratified by the Senate. It's a political agreement. And therefore, there's nothing binding the next administration to keep it. So the Obama administration signed it in 2018 or in 2015. And true to form, in 2018, the Trump administration pulled out of it. And they said, we're not going to keep this agreement with Iran anymore. And we're going to pull out of this agreement. Now, during the 2020 election, there was a, this was actually a, a political topic during the election. And the Biden administration s stated their goal was to rejoin this agreement. And so when the Biden administration came into office in, um, in, two, in 2020, they began working to rejoin this agreement. Now, what's been interesting to watch is how they've tried to rejoin it. First of all, we have to remember, this is a nuclear agreement. And who is the only country in the world that's dropped nuclear bombs on people? The United States of America. So the fact that we think we have the integrity to tell anyone what they can and cannot do with nuclear energy or, or weapons is absurd, right? We're the only nation who's used it to kill civilians. We have no right to tell anyone what they can and cannot do. But second, when we negotiated to rejoin this agreement, we acted like we had the moral high ground. And Iran is like, what are you talking about? A, you guys use these weapons, and B, you left the agreement. <laughs> you left it. And they pretty much ensured that we were never going to agree to it again because in April 10 of 2020, the Iranian lawmakers stipulated conditions for returning to the agreement. And their stipulation was that the United States should give legal guarantees approved by its Congress that it will not exit this pact again. Well, we don't make this kind of promise to anybody. So we're sure not going to make it to non-white people from the Middle East, right? So understanding those two things, I now want to look at the Constitution. 
Article 6, Clause 2 of the Constitution states that treaties are the supreme law of the land. If there is a disagreement, the treaty is what gets interpreted as law alongside the Constitution. Treaties are the supreme law of the land. Now in 2020, there was a Supreme Court case that most of you probably heard about. It was called McGirt versus Oklahoma. For those of you not familiar, under Indian law, when a native person commits a crime against another native person on a reservation, the jurisdiction for that crime falls to the federal government, meaning they're tried in federal court instead of state court. So McGirt, a native man, committed a horrific crime against an, another native person in the city of Tulsa, and he was tried in the state court of Oklahoma and found guilty. No one questioned his guilt, but he appealed because he said, according to treaty, Tulsa is on a reservation, as is most of eastern Oklahoma, and therefore I should have been tried, McGirt said, in federal court, not state court. The state of Oklahoma responded and said, we have never treated Tulsa as a reservation, and the courts have actually agreed with us, therefore we have every right to try you in a state court. The court went all the way, or this case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the court wrote their opinion on it in the summer of 2020. I was running for president. There was a lot of anticipation within Indian country about this case because it was about treaties and about native rights. And the day this opinion came out, I actually took the day off from campaigning and I read the entire opinion because I do not trust the Supreme Court. Now, most Amer Native Americans were thrilled with the ruling. Because the ruling, which was written by Neil Gorsuch, was in favor of McGirt. The ruling stated that the state of Oklahoma and the courts do not have the right to break treaties. They do not have the right to disestablish reservations. And therefore, all of eastern Oklahoma, including Tulsa, for judicial purposes, is still considered a reservation, and therefore McGirt and probably hundreds, if not thousands, of other native peoples need to be retried in federal court instead of state court. Right? This was met with great fanfare from Indian country. But I don't trust the Supreme Court. So I read the entire opinion. Neil Gorsuch went on to say, to determine whether a tribe continues to hold a reservation, there is only one place we must look, the acts of Congress. This court long ago held that the legislature wields significant constitutional authority when it comes to tribal relations, possessing even the authority to breach its own promises and treaties. Only Congress can divest a reservation of its land and diminish its boundaries. So it's no matter how many other promises to a tribe the federal government has already broken, if Congress wishes to break the promise of a reservation, it must say so. So the court basically said, yeah, the state doesn't have the right to break treaties. The courts don't have the right to break treaties. Only Congress has the right to break treaties. And any time they go on in another part of the statement, any time Congress can muster the will, there's no magic way to say it. They just have to state they want to break the treaty. I'm putting a few pieces on the table. We're going to bring this all together, OK? Next, I want to talk about the Gibeonites. If you read your Old Testament, the Gibeonites were living in the land of Canaan when Israel came to claim their promised lands. 
They were one of the nations set to be destroyed by Israel. They saw Israel come into their land. They saw the Israelites destroy all these other nations, and they were terrified of the, of the, the Israelis, the Israelites. And so they also were very shrewd. So they sent an envoy to Joshua, and they said to Josh, they, they dressed their, they actually were pretty shrewd. They dressed their envoy up like they had traveled all across the wilderness. They, they put them on old camels that looked like they were nearly dead. They had worn clothes. They looked like they were about ready to die themselves. And they went to Joshua and they said, we've heard about your power. We've heard about everything you're doing. We're terrified of you. We've come a long way across the wilderness. Please sign a treaty with us to spare our lives. I think Joshua was kind of flattered that his reputation had reached so far. And so without checking out their story or consulting God, he signed a treaty with them. found out a few verses later that the Gibeonites weren't from far away. They were right around the corner. In fact, they were the next land that they were supposed to conquer. And Joshua upset his entire nation. It says the whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders answered, we have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. So basically, Joshua said, because we have a covenant with God, we will keep our treaty. We will keep our treaty with the Gibeonites. In 2 Samuel, when King David is the king of Israel, after Joshua and the judges had gone away and Saul had, their first king had left office, David found Israel in a period where they had three years of famine. And he went to God and he said, why are we having famine right now? And God said, because your predecessor, your predecessor Saul, broke the treaty with the Gibeonites. And I'm not going to, and, and you're going to suffer until you make it right and you keep the treaty. Everything okay? Really? Well, the, the noise that we just had here, we just had uh, somebody uh, broke one of the windows in the door out there with a brick just now. So uh, I'm going to go out and check it out right now. But yeah, we're all OK, though. It looks like it might have been one of the, one of the street people. So. OK. few people going out to check what's going on. So why is this important? Because America claims that we have a land covenant with the God of Abraham. We claim that Europeans claim that Turtle Island is their promised land. And they actually claim that the Constitution is divinely inspired, right? Just a few months ago, Arizona House Speaker Rusty Bowers said, and it is a tenet of my faith that the Constitution is divinely inspired of my most basic foundational beliefs. Wyoming Congresswoman Liz Cheney said, we have been reminded what it means to take an oath under God to the Constitution, what it means to defend the Constitution, and we're reminded by Speaker Bowers that our Constitution is indeed a divinely inspired document. So the United States of America loves to claim that it has a land covenant with the God of Abraham, and we even love to claim that our Constitution is inspired by God. But we don't truly believe this. 
This is how we justify our oppression of native peoples. This is how we justify our oppression of black people. This is how we justify our oppression of women. This is how we justify the violence we commit against people of color. But we don't truly believe that we have a covenant with the God of Abraham. Do you know how I know this? Because we have no value for covenants. Every treaty we've signed with native nations, we've broken. We do everything possible to make it clear that the United States of America is accountable to nobody, including our own constitution. Even though our constitution states treaties are the supreme law of the land, in 2020, the Supreme Court ruled that Congress has the right to break treaties. We're actually the exact opposite of a Christian nation. We're a godless nation that believes it's accountable to nobody. And this is why we believe we have the right to break treaties with impunity. So there's one more paradigm I want to challenge for you and that this book will challenge for you. Because now that we understand this, we have to say, well, what's the solution? Well, the solution is not to make the nation Christian. The, tr the solution is not to legislate one group's theologies. The solution is not to reclaim this nation for God. That's not the solution. That's what caused the problem in the first place. The paradigm that will be challenged for you in this book, not explicitly, but implicitly, throughout the entire book, based on the language that we use and the things we choose to highlight, the paradigm we're trying to shift for you is that white people are not superior. You do not, it's amazing how many people believe that white people are superior. And I'm not just talking white supremacists, right? Ruth Bader Ginsburg believed white people were superior when she ruled in 2005. If you follow me on social media, every few months on my Twitter account, I post a statement that says, white people are not superior. And you know what? Some people call me racist for saying that. Think about that. We live in a country where I am racist because I state that white people are not superior. This is the challenge. This is why I don't use the word racial reconciliation. Why? Reconciliation implies the, the, the history was harmonious. That's not true. There's only one group of people that can look back on our history with any sense of nostalgia and say, oh, remember how great things used to be. You know what group that is? White men. The only group who can look back and say, oh, it used to be better back then. Women can't look back and say that. Natives can't look back and say that. Black people can't look back and say that. No one can look back and say that. So when we say things like racial reconciliation, it means we're going back to a previous harmonious relationship which didn't exist. This is why I use the term racial conciliation. This is also why I don't use the word um, white privilege. White privilege makes it sound like white people haven't given a blessing, they just have to learn how to share. The reason white people have things that other people don't have is not because they've been blessed, it's because they are getting the fruits of an oppressive history, an oppressive foundation. That's something that needs to be confronted, not just learned how to share with. This is why land titles is such a big challenge, right? This is what makes it so difficult. This belief has been written into 
our foundations. It's been written into our Constitution, written into our Declaration of Independence, written into the ethos of this country, and this is what we need to challenge. And if we're going to address the challenges we're facing, we have to be able to acknowledge that not only do black lives matter, native lives matter, but that white people are not superior. We tend to see white people up here and everyone else down here. And it's good if you drop off charity and go back up. It's better if you drop off, come down here and try to lift people up, but then you still go back. But the belief is, is that this is where you're supposed to be, right? This is where the enviable position is. This is where you want to aspire to. The problem is to be up here requires the oppression of people down here. The average American lifestyle is not sustainable globally. We are one fifth of the world's population. Or I'm sorry, we're one twentieth of the world's population and we consume a quarter of the world's resources. If everyone in the world consume like the average American, the depletable resources, renewable resources of our, of our globe would be gone by the end of April. Right? We've all been complaining about high gas prices, right? Almost $5 a gallon about a month ago. Guess what? I did some research. At the highest price of gas we had a month and a half ago, we were still paying less than most Europeans were paying for gas a year and a half ago. We believe it's our right to have cheap resources whenever we want. This is the challenge. The American lifestyle is not sustainable. Living up here is not sustainable. So yes, we have to lift up the people living in poverty down here, but we have to drop these people down a ton so we can all live as human beings seeing eye to eye and understanding we're equal and no one is inferior and no one is superior. This is where we have to be, not up here. Up here is not sustainable. We've heard just a, a few weeks ago, this week, right, about this bill that was passed by the Democratic Congress, the Democratic Senate about climate change, right? We've heard about this. You have to understand, over the past eight months, gas prices in Ukraine, because of the war in Ukraine, have gone really high. When prices go high, what happens to usage, to consumption? It drops, right? What's causing climate change? Fossil fuels, right? The burning of fossil fuels. So while our gas prices are going up, which should mean we're driving less because it's becoming more expensive, so we're actually helping the environment, do you know what we've been doing as a nation? We've been doing everything to bring gas prices down again. We released a million barrels of oil a day from the, from the National Reserve. We just went to Saudi Arabia and made nice with them in spite of all their atrocities so they would produce more oil. The government is begging oil companies to drill more and to produce more oil, right? Why? Because American people don't want to pay a lot for gas. We want to drive our big trucks, we want to drive our SUVs, we want to Up here is not sustainable. We have to remember that. White people are not superior. What they have is not what we're supposed to aspire to. We need to change the rules. We need to aspire to something different. And that is what I want 
to change in the paradigm. It's great we're not celebrating Columbus Day as much anymore. We have to address land titles. Right? We have to address these things at the foundational level. And this is what I want to come out of the reading of this book. These are the challenges I want people to grapple with. These are the things I want people to wrestle with. These are the struggles I want us to have. These are the conversations I want us to engage in. And this is why I wrote On Selling Truths. And this is why I'm traveling across the country promoting this book and trying to get people to talk about it and to, and to, um, to, to discuss it. We have signed copies of the book over here. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, you're happy to do that. We're actually running a special right now during this book tour, which is if you buy 10 copies of the book um, for a book study, you have 10 friends you want to do a book study with, maybe with your church or with a, another group you're involved in, um, we will get your name and address. And some point during your study, when it's convenient for you, I will schedule a 45-minute virtual Q&A with your study for free. So if you buy 10 copies of the book today or at some point over the, uh, online from us too, um, I will give your study a 45-minute Q&A um, that you can study for this, uh, that you can have with me uh, about the book. I'm doing everything I can to get our nation and our country to discuss these things. This book tour is not being funded by, um, by any large group. There's no PR firm. My publisher isn't even funding this. I just went out, I got in my car with my daughter, and we're driving across the country um, doing this book tour. So we actually started GoFundMe if you want to help support the expenses of this book tour. Uh, on my website in the back is a link where you can, um, you can uh, help fund this book tour. But I, I really want to thank you for taking time to join us tonight. I want to thank you for the chance to talk with you. Do we have time for a few minutes of Q&A? Yeah, I'd love, if there's some questions people want to ask, I'd love to take some time to do some Q&A as well. And so uh, let me pass the mic over to Casey here. Wow, that was awesome. Let's give him a hand. That, that was really, really great. I know my, uh, my wife back there, law school graduate, she was just, uh, she was eating this up. <laughs> she she re memorized all those things that you were talking about there too and was uh, been taking notes and all. But I want to, uh, Apologize for you know this neighborhood we live in now and then so things like that happen. So uh, and it was funny thing it was the guy two guys that I just gave them a meal uh, here just a few when we first started. So you know keep us in prayer here. You know the, the world out there is you know unpredictable. So uh, we want to give some time for uh, some dialogue. Uh, good medicine way. That's one thing we do on our Monday evenings. We have become a real resource for real uh, deep topics, contextual topics, working native ministries, and having Mark here on this night here also, we, he has been with us before, and also did Q&A with us, so we, I want to open it up, and I'll give the mic back to him. Uh, Brian will probably be looking at the uh, internet to see if there's any, uh, in the chat, if there's any questions on there. So let's, uh, Leah. Yeah. On, on my website, which is wirelesshogan.com, and if you want to share the link, actually, I can maybe share the link into the chat. Um, but my website is wirelesshogan.com. And on that website, there's a link to my On Selling Truths page on my website, and you can buy signed copies of the book there. You can also purchase uh, the, the 10 books special there on that same website. So I will put that into the chat here and then you can actually share that um, out. Let me, let me get that here real quick. I just there I just put the link into the chat if you want to share that out to the other sites you can as well any other questions 
Yes. Good evening. I just introduced myself in Navajo and listening to um, Mark's introduction earlier this evening, he is related to me through clans. Um, he is Twodichini. That is my first clan and that is his fourth clan. So he is my nala. He is my grandfather. So with that, um, I have one comment and one question. So when you were talking about President Lincoln, and the atrocities that he had on us as Navajo people, Diné, with the Long Walk, which had occurred from 1863 to 1868. I wanted to also express that he, in the Southwest, was also deemed as a, you know, had, what would you say, favoritism with the Pueblos, at the same time, there was atrocities to us as Navajo people. And, and in New Mexico, there's 19 Pueblos and two Apache tribes, Muscalero and Hickoria, and then Diné. So at that particular time, as our relatives, and I'm a fourth generation of the Long Walk people, my great-grandmother was part of that. He, at the same time, President, um, Lincoln was also giving presidential canes to the Pueblo people, to their leaders. And so they hold those canes in high esteem, even today. And I've seen one of them um, in one of my visits there. But I just wanted to bring that up in terms of how he could turn to the left and bring about atrocities and then turn to the right and be favored among another um, set of native peoples. The second thing that I wanted to ask you, um, Shanale, is when you were talking about um, the trauma that white people have experienced as perpetrators of violence, trauma, historical trauma, and, and all of that. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you. <laughs> you. You talk about that, are you expressing that as someone who has observation or someone with lived experience being that you're half Diné and half Belagana. I appreciate you asking that question. Um, yeah, so for a long time, and, and um, as you heard in my introduction when I introduced myself, I acknowledge both my mother's people and my father's people. And I've said for years, right, because of who my parents are, it makes my job incredibly difficult. Right, um, my life would have been so much easier had I just stayed in the white world and never gone to the res, or had I just stayed on the res and never gone out to the rest of the world. And I, I truly think that because of who my family is, my parents are, and because of my deep respect for both of my parents and my, my, my necessity to acknowledge all of my clans, Right, it's funny because when I'm when I'm in when I'm on the reservation, people know I'm not fully Navajo. Right, they're like <laughs> they they can see it that I'm not, and so when I'm on the reservation, I have to tell people I'm Dutch, because that's who my mother is, 
And when I'm off the reservation, right, um, Western culture is patriarchal and patrilineal, and so I have to acknowledge my father. And so there, if I, went, if I ran around the country telling everyone I was Dutch or I was white, they would be like, you're crazy. So I, I always have to acknowledge my father on both sides, on, you know, on, on that side. And so it's, it's, I feel like it's really been something that God has challenged me to do, is how do I have this conversation without just demonizing one side or the other? How do I really acknowledge both my mother's people and my father's people? And I think this is one of the reasons why I was not satisfied with the paradigm that we have for white people, which is either you're racist or you're fragile. Because I didn't find either of those helpful. Um, I didn't find the, the paradigm of racism, right? If, you're, if, you're, if because you lack pigmentation in your skin, that means you're racist, that wasn't satisfying to me because it meant any time a white person disagreed with me or even confronted me, it meant I had to treat that as a threat and either defend myself or go offensive against them. If I saw, and, and it also meant that there was no room for white people in the conversation. If I saw white people first and foremost as fragile, and after the lynching of George Floyd, right, the, the book by, by Robin DiAngelo, White Fragility, shot through the roof and became a national bestseller. And Robin DiAngelo has some great insight into the psyche of whiteness, but I struggle with her paradigm of fragility because if I treat white people as fragile, it means every time they get upset, I have to try to soothe it over. And I can never talk about the harder things that need to be discussed. And so I think it's because I wanted to acknowledge my mother and my father that I was not satisfied with merely treating white people as racist or as fragile. And that's why I sought out something else and that's why even observing it i i right i first observed when i when i would go out and i would speak earlier to my earlier audiences this is maybe seven or eight years ago i would give my lecture on the doctrine of discovery going through the history and the violence and everything else and after my talks i would have two lines in front of me one would be a line of people of color native peoples african americans other minorities and they would come they were almost excited they were like right I didn't know all the dates, I didn't know all the specifics, but I knew our history was that bad, and I thank you for identifying it and labeling it. And they were almost giddy about it. And then I would have a line of white people, and they would come up, and their faces were just like a sheet. And they would say two things to me. I had no idea the history was that bad, and tell me how to fix it. There was one time where I was speaking, this was um, at, a, at, a, at a Christian conference, and I was speaking, and I was going through the history. And as I was going through, there was a, a, a young man who was white near in the front row, and I could tell he was really being struck by what I was saying. And I could tell it was deeply impacting him, and he was taking it very, very um, sincerely and really wrestling with what I was saying. And it even was disturbing him. And after the lecture, I did a Q&A, and he was one of the first people to raise his hand. And I was hesitant to call on him, but I decided to call on him. And he wasn't, he was so emotional, he was kind of wandering around verbally for a little bit. And I could tell eventually that he was going to apologize to me as he was talking and he was kind of talking and I could tell he was gonna to apologize to me and finally I said, sir, I have to stop you right here. I said, let me tell you why. I said, you're a white male American. Your worldview is incredibly individualistic. And so what's happening right now is you're hearing about 500 years of horrific injustice, but because your worldview is very individualistic, it's all coming down on your shoulders. And the only thing that you're thinking right now is I have no idea how I'm going to go to sleep tonight because I feel so crappy. And so you, a Christian, want to stand up and apologize to me, a native Christian. 
You want to have some sort of reconciliation here. Of course, we're doing this publicly, so I have to forgive you, right? Otherwise, I, 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 I have no sincerity. And then you get to go home to your bed in the suburbs and sleep well tonight. Meanwhile, I'm going to get back on a plane and fly back to the reservation, and you get to go to bed with all the fruits of the injustice, and I have to go back and deal with the dregs of the injustice, and nothing has changed. Nothing is different. I said, I, I'm not mad at you. I'm not looking for your apology. I need you to understand how broken this thing is. And I need you to be willing to make deep and meaningful change beyond just a photograph. And that's one of the places where I began realizing I have to find a better way to talk to white people because A, I would either get people apologizing to me or B, I would get people standing up and calling me a liar. And that's where I began to, and as I looked at my line of white people standing here, I, I said to my, my family and I even said to my friends, I said, I see trauma in their eyes. I can see it. And that's where I started talking to some, some colleagues in the psych field and trying to understand what it was I was observing. And I, I, I won't go the, in depth into it here, but I actually had experienced perpetration-induced traumatic stress. When I was in high school, I was the driver of a car actually going to Denver, and we were driving close to Santa Fe, and we got into an accident. And I was the driver of the car. It was a single car accident. And my brother was in the passenger seat and he died. And I had to wrestle through my own guilt. Not just of being the survivor of the accident, but of the fact that I was the driver of the car that killed my brother. And it was a very challenging thing, but I, what I realized I was recognizing, I was recognizing the same fear and terror in the eyes of the white people in front of me that I had for years as I was horrified about dealing with the fact that I was the driver of the car that killed my brother. And so that's why when I learned about, and I always thought I was wrestling with PTSD, so when I found this book about perpetration-induced traumatic stress, I said, not only does this describe me, it also describes all the white people I see right in front of me. And so my whole goal with this was to find a way to bring white people into the conversation that actually led to meaningful dialogue instead of just them disrupting and completely taking over the conversation either derailing it or just taking it over. And I have to tell you, since I've been treating my white audiences as another group of traumatized people, it's one of the most effective tools I've developed to keep white people from co-opting my conversations and leading to more deep and meaningful dialogue. So I appreciate you asking that question. I, that's, it, it's, that's a fairly big paradigm that I'm trying to shift here. And it's primarily in the hypothesis stage right now, right? I, Rachel McNair's research is on the individual diagnosis of a perpetration-induced traumatic stress, and I'm applying it like you would historical trauma. Um, and so it, it's definitely, it, it's not a scientific statement, but it's, I'm saying, if this is possible with PTSD, then might not this also be possible with PITS? And I'm finding it to be effective, even though there has to be a lot more research into that. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah.
Oh, Gigi, uh, go ahead and answer, ask your question. Hey, my brother, thank you uh, for being here and for, for um, just your, your investment in pouring out. My question is around um, the, the issue of land titles. And do you have any suggestions of um, practical ways to mobilize, practical, effective ways to mobilize to actually bring change? This is the problem, right? So there's a lot of a lot of places, even churches and individuals who are giving land back, right? They're they're giving land back. And even if you read the 2005 Supreme Court opinion, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in her opinion, argued, she said, rather than claiming sovereignty over this land, we have a method that you can put the land back into the reservation system and you can acquire it that way. The problem is lands, reservation lands aren't owned by the tribes. They're trust lands owned by the government. I tell people that native peoples were sovereign over our lands like your teenage child is sovereign over their bedroom, right? They can put a sign on the door, but by all that, that's not their room, it's your parents' house. And that's because that's the situation, even if your church gives land back to a tribe, even if you donate your house to a tribe, you are primarily giving it back to the government because the land held by the tribe are held in trust by the government. And so this is where I'm saying we have to address this at a foundational level. And that's the conversation that so few people want to have, is we have to change the underlying system. And that's the system that most people don't want to begin to touch. And so unfortunately, right, this is where I, I do a lot of consulting with denominations and churches about repudiating the doctrine of discovery. And I, wrote, I write about that in the book even. And I, my basic answer is because the system we have is broken at a federal foundational level, individual solutions are not going to fix it right now, right? One thing I might suggest, right, and this is, this is something I, I, I've committed to myself, which is... I've committed that I am not going to buy, I, I owned a house once in Denver before the, the market crashed and we ended up having to sell it. And I've basically come to the agreement or to the understanding that I am not going to buy another house in the United States of America unless I can get the permission of the tribe whose land it's on traditionally and if I did buy that house, I would make an agreement with them, not reparations, but basically to say that because the US government claims title over the land, I pay property tax to the government. So one solution that I would try to negotiate is I would say, can I work out with a tribe that I would pay essentially a property tax to them as long as I own the house? Meaning, so every year I would, I would, I would pay them a property tax, probably similar to the same property tax I paid to the government, acknowledging their traditional title and sovereignty over those lands and saying in the midst of this broken system that doesn't acknowledge your sovereignty, I would rather find a way to address it in a way that doesn't just give it back to the control of the government. So that's one solution I would probably try to do if I were to buy another house. I'm currently renting my house in Denver, and so I'm not a landowner right now. And, and I, I right, the only way, place I wouldn't do that is if I bought a house within the traditional boundaries of Denete, of the, our four sacred mountains of my Navajo people. Um, because those are our lands. But if I were to buy land belonging to any other tribe, I would first get their permission, and second, I would try to work out some sort of tax that I could pay to them 
acknowledging that they have sovereignty over that land. But because the system's broken, only, the only solution we're going to have are going to be piecemeal right now, which is why I ran for president in 2020, because I'm like, if we want to break the system, or if we want to fix the system, we have to deal with it at a national level. That was a great question, though. Thanks for asking that. Yes. So I had a question that kind of piggybacks off of this last question, but before I get into that, I just want to thank everyone here at Good Medicine Way for hosting this event tonight and all everyone coming out and bringing you Mark Charles here. And uh, it was really fascinating to hear, you know, you talk about your book. Um, one thing I want to acknowledge is that um, I'm on my fourth reading of your book and definitely um, I'm growing more comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. Um, this this fourth time. So thank you for for everything you've written in your book. So um, Definitely identify as a Mark Charles nerd over here, you know, hearing all your podcasts and everything. So, so with this question, um, it, uh, to, for me to frame it, I'm uh, having a hard time because we were rushing out the door and I forgot my question written down at the house. So I'll, I'll try to provide a little bit of context. Um, with our complicated history here in New Mexico, because we have um, settler colonial his history, not only with the United States, but with Mexico and with Spain, um, I'm someone who benefits from the settler colonial history of, of Spanish and Mexican land grants along with uh, the Abraham Lincoln uh, 1862 Homestead Act. So I, come, I live and my family live up in northern New Mexico and we have a history in, in the north where we have uh, resistance for our, against land theft and land grabs. So right now in New Mexico, there's about 20% left of land grants, original land grants that were given from Spain and Mexico. Now, the challenge is uh, talking to people in my community um, who are elders, you know, that you're, you're heirs to land grants. And there's a little similarities between people that live on reservations and pueblos, but definitely we have a lot of our benefits that that uh, people on, on reservations and pueblos don't, don't get. Now, um, my challenge is that while we get to benefit from a lot of these lands, even though a lot of them were, were stolen and, and sold off from land, land grabs, that we don't acknowledge a whole lot here, at least in northern New Mexico, we don't acknowledge the the trauma, the perpetration that we did to gain that land. And so when we have heirs from land, land grants, there's uh, uh, an idea that I like to think about from another author. I won't get into his book or, or his name because we're focused on you, but he has a quote that I'll paraphrase and it says something about land titles. Um, and it says with, with property, it doesn't just depend on violence, it requires it. And so as long as we are excluding some people from this land and including only certain others, heirs of the land grants, that we're perpetrating current violence. So my question is, I've had to read your book a few times to just really get a good grip on, on this idea of land titles and how it kind of relates to me and my identity and, and you know a lot of northern New Mexico. How would you start the conversation with you know the elders that are considered land grant heirs? Like someone like me, I'm not an heir to land grants, but my elders are heirs to that land grant. How would you start the conversation of something like your book? Uh, Appreciate it. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I found with a lot of these dialogues, especially these dialogues around race, or around history that are so deep and so personal, as well as so partisan, I find the best way to introduce the conversation is usually through some sort of media or a third party. So like, I, I don't generally sit down and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people about these things in a, in a very direct way. Um, I will often, I, I have a ton of resources online. I have videos that I show to people. 
um, my the the TEDx talk that I gave. What I try to do is I share those resources with people. I, I give people not just my book, but other books to read that I know bring a good perspective in there. And then once they've read them, or they've watched the videos, or they've, they've been exposed to this, then I try to have conversation with them. And so I find that a lot of times just sitting down and presenting this information to another party in the hopes of having a, a favorable dialogue about it, that can be real difficult because when you're the one bringing the difficult um, history and you're wanting to have the dialogue about it, it can be very challenging. And this is like for, and even in my own work, right, I, I speak and I travel all around the country and for me, the best conversations I have don't happen in the Q and A's right after I speak. They don't even happen in the in the the. the usually, when I speak, I, I stay somewhere a couple of days. I've at a conference, and I'll stay the second day because the first day, all of the questions will be triggered by trauma, and so I are, I can almost guess what questions they're going to ask after a presentation. I stay the second day because when people go to sleep at night and they have a few REM cycles in and their brain sorts a few things out and their adrenaline falls down, I'll get a second batch of questions the second day. But the best questions I get is when I run into people four, five, six months later and they say, Mr. Charles, I've been thinking about this thing you wrote or that you said and I've been stuck on it for the past six months and I really want to talk about it. Those are the conversations I live for. Because now they've been wrestling with it, they've been exposed to it, they've been thinking about it, and now they're re ready to really have an in-depth dialogue about what do we do about it. And so this is the same thing on the personal level. Find a way, preferably even outside of just your conversations, to expose them to those things so then you can be the one they have a conversation about, about it with later. Um, and so a few books I would highly recommend. Um, this book written by Sarah Augustine called The Land Is Not Empty. She is a brilliant author. I had the honor of writing the foreword for this book. I highly recommend this book. It gives a great example of how this, um, this history is in play today, not just by governments, but by corporations. And then I'm actually working through this book right now, and it's a, I'm, it's a slow read for me because it's a difficult book, How to Hide an Empire. Um, just like my book is an eye-opener for so many people, the book Sung Chan and I, my co-author, wrote together, um, this book was an eye-opener to me. There's so many things I didn't realize about how our nation hides its imperial ways. Um, and I thought I was fairly <laughs> aware of those things. So th that would be my recommendation, is that's the, I found the best way to have the most meaningful dialogue, is find a third way, a third party, whether it's a book or a video or someone else that, so basically that anger they have can be directed at them and not at you so then you can have the dialogue once they've kind of worked through some of that anger yeah that's a good question thanks for asking that i know it's getting kind of late um maybe one more question and then we'll go ahead yes over here I have one question, but I have two kids that are Dutch and Navajo. And my question is, why did they bother to make treaties if they're going to break them? That is a very good question. I can't answer for the psyche of the people who wrote the treaties. Um, but. Yeah, I, I think that's a very valid question, which is why, if our government has literally no intention of holding itself accountable to keep treaties, why would they ever write them? Unless it's merely to give the semblance of, of honor, right? Even though they have no intention of, of, of keeping that honor. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you, but I understand why you're asking that because it's one of the questions I ask myself a lot frequently is what do you do right when, when you have a nation that doesn't believe it's accountable to anybody and that and their word their word doesn't hold any weight because they don't keep their word but they have a ton of power that's where it becomes tricky 
I actually preached the sermon, and it's online. If you Google Mark Charles and the words power and authority, I preached the sermon on Mark 6. Um, and it's about the biblical dynamics of power and authority. So power is having the ability to act, and authority is having the right of jurisdiction. And so I really explore what does it mean when you have a lot of power, but you don't have any authority? And what happens if you have a ton of authority, but you don't have any power? <laughs> and you know, th those are the dynamics we have to look at. And then I look at that biblically, and I look most specifically at Jesus, who people say he was very powerful. But if you look at him very closely, most of what he did, he did through his authority. He cast out demons with authority. He spoke with authority. He healed people with authority, right? He calmed the sea with authority. He raised people from the dead with his authority. And so I think when we look at Jesus, we see someone holding that authority very well, even though they had a ton of power, but they operated very humbly this way. So I don't have a direct answer to your question, but I think that sermon, at least it, 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 gave, it, it gives you some ways to think about what our, what our nation struggles with, which is we have a ton of power but no authority. And what does it mean to hold our nation accountable even though we don't have the power over it? So sorry if that felt a little convoluted, but I appreciate you bringing that up. It's a great thing for us to kind of ponder and think about tonight. I want to thank you, Casey, and I want to thank everybody here and everyone online for joining this session tonight. I love these dialogues. I really appreciate the conversations. Um, we have, even if you're not going to buy a book tonight, I encourage you to pick up a bookmark. We have free bookmarks here that you can pick up and take with you. And uh, if you want to get a copy of the book, we have those on sale as well. I'm very open to staying afterwards and answering more questions and having more conversation. But Casey, yeah, thank you very much. Let's give him uh, another round here. Great. How about online there too? Let's hear from online there too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a good, really good turnout here, some 15, 16 people here, and then some 28 that were on our screen here, and that's, uh, that's pretty typical from uh, on, on screen, but you really blessed us with your presence here tonight here. It was great to have, have you here and to join us here, know where we are and know who we are. Uh, good medicine way. We're really trying to do something different here in Albuquerque. and, and I got a good team behind me. I could never do this technology. I'll let you know right now. But I can plug in and I can plug this in and I can put things away. And, and Brian and Leah, they are great at this. I appreciate them greatly. Uh, but Mark is just, uh, he's been with us before. And maybe down the road we can have him again. And uh, maybe some kind of conference on this. Maybe we can put together. I know my friend here, Ken, he's already put one on here just, uh, just recently, too. And um, his co-author, uh, just a couple sessions ago on Mondays, you can look at his. It's archived already. So Chung Ra was our speaker online here. And his conversation went on, too. A lot of question and answer with that. So you know, take a look at that. And you can end this book here. You're right. Here, October 24th, we're going to have Sarah Augustine is going to be our speaker here. So you'll get to hear, hear that. I got that book. Ken gave me a book, one of those books. Got the reading on that a little bit. She's got a great story to tell. Uh, different view, too. Very different view that you, you might think as well. So I just want to appreciate everyone for coming uh, and let you know that Good Medicine Way does this kind of thing. This caliber of a speaker we want to bring on so that you can be educated uh, more than uh, you know having to go to college or having to go to a seminary. We bring it to you, that kind of caliber of, of speaker, so that you can get. I tell people uh, this is, we should start giving CEUs so you get credit for this or something. So come on and stay with us and help us to grow this program. So, uh, Mark, I want to ask you if you would pray for us and close us out. Let's go ahead and um, end this time in prayer. Creator, 
Thank you for another day. Thank you for the sun that rose this morning. Thank you for the moon that's in the sky tonight. Thank you for the rain that fell here in Albuquerque. Thank you for the life that you are bringing to the land. Creator, your creation is beautiful. Your desert here in the Southwest is amazing. The skies are amazing. The flowers are amazing. Thank you for everything you've blessed us with and, and the way that this gets renewed every single day. Creator, there is, there is sickness and war and fear and hurt and addiction and violence all throughout our world. There is hate and anger and it feels sometimes overwhelming and even oppressive. But we pray, Creator, that we will keep ourselves rooted in you. We pray that we will remember to take time to watch the sunrise. And we pray that you will help us through your Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ to walk in beauty with you, with our neighbors, with our relatives, and with this world that you've placed us in. Yeah, creator. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, there is a little bit more food back there. If you want to take some, if you want to take a plate home, you're welcome to do that because way more there than I can eat and my wife can eat. So, And also Good Medicine Way has a table back here as well. The Bible, the First Nations Version Bible, if you are native, you get a free copy. And those that are not Native, if you donate $20, we will buy more copies so that we can give it to more Native people. So I'd like you to you know, offer that to you. The t-shirts are a donation of $20. We got all different kinds of sizes because the first time we ordered them, we ordered them all too small. Just say it. <laughs> so we got some 3X in there too for some of our larger folks. And, uh, some of my big buddies here, like Barry Belindo, he's a big six foot two, big old guy. He needs a shirt too, and he wanted one, so we made sure we ordered him one too. So I want to thank you for coming. Uh, let's visit a little bit, grab a drink on your way out. I think there's a couple more cookies, so make sure those go. Thank you, Mark, and thank you everybody else for coming. <laughs>